mention. Thank you. Yeah, sit down if you can. Yeah, you can go ahead and sit down if you can. Just want to mention one thing to you, and uh, this is a prayer request, and it just reminds me so much of it that the Lord just fills us with His love and fills us with His heart, and we represent His love and His heart. And um, this week, a terrible tragedy with a young man on our coast that was hit by a train. And Justin and Holly know these, know the, the family very well and are, are ministering to them in a very personal way. And it's just such a tragedy and such a sadness. And a mom, a young mom left with two children. The dad uh, killed in a freak accident, getting hit by a train and just really terrible for a family and so forth. But uh, we're able to minister out of love and minister out of goodness, you know, and so... God bless and God's leading and God's moving and so we're going to we're going to let that happen and we're going to let the Lord lead in that and the Lord work in that and so we're going to pray for that and pray that the Lord would use our life and lead our life and guide our life and that God would be exalted in our life and that he would use them in in this to minister his love and his life to someone who needs it his strength, you know, and uh, in the presence of the Lord, fear can't stand, pain can't stand, uh, grief can't stand in the presence of the Lord. So we're going to pray for the presence of the Lord in their life. Father, touch Brandy and her children or touch their family this day and allow those that are ministering in Jesus' name to minister life to them. Only you can change these things. Only you can have enough strength to move in their life, and we pray for your purpose to be accomplished in Jesus' name, I pray. And everybody said, all God's people, amen, amen, and amen. All right, praise the Lord. Oh, yeah, hallelujah. Well, we're in the attitudes to be today, right? We're in the third one. How many of you are aware of this? Okay, am I preaching to the right crowd? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, beautiful. And, um, you know, we, we, we started a, a couple of weeks ago, in Matthew 5, and in Matthew 5, it's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the great, wonderful uh, constitution of the kingdom of God, what Jesus teaches us, what the kingdom of God's all about, what happens there, what it's going to be, and how the, the rules are for the kingdom of God, and what we can expect from him, and what we can expect from life, and, and all of these as the constitution of the kingdom of God. You know, a constitution spells out the provisions for a kingdom or, or land. We, we in the United States of America have a constitution, and this constitution guides our land. It's the rules for our land, and it describes what we can expect from our land. Our constitution as America's, Americans, thank goodness, uh, really is all about limiting the government, and so the government cannot, cannot take us over. It's the, our constitution is... Uh, about what limits uh, the power of our government to take away from us. The constitution of the kingdom of God is basically what we can expect from God to do, not necessarily what, uh, what he's going to overpower us with, but what can we expect from him as we live in his kingdom. We're alive right now in the kingdom of God, but the kingdom of God is not yet complete and I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I mean, we're, when, once you give your heart to the Lord and you surrender to his will, you become part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom, that spiritual kingdom that everybody who knows the Lord belongs to of every denomination, of every stripe and, and, and substance. If you have surrendered your heart to Christ, if you're a Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, uh, Catholic, whatever you might be, if you've surrendered your heart to the Lord, we all belong to the kingdom of God. But we know that the kingdom of God is not yet complete, that it is, it, we're in it and it's here but one of these days, according to what the prophets teach us and what the book of Revelation teaches us, uh, the kingdom of God will become complete. And when will that happen? Well, it'll happen, and I don't want to be confusing about it, but it, it'll happen in the future when uh, every, the, everybody on earth goes through what is called the tribulation, and it lasts for seven years, and at the end, 
Um, God's, Jesus is going to come back and set up a kingdom here on earth that will last for a thousand years. It's called the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year kingdom. And during that time, we, Jesus is going to come back to the earth according to the book of Revelation and the prophets, and he's going to set up a kingdom uh, on this earth. And he's going to be the king sitting on the throne on this earth for a thousand years and, it, and, and the Bible teaches that we who, who love him and know him are going to rule and reign with him. So what will we be doing during the kingdom, during the, the, the establishment of the millennial kingdom? We'll be, he'll sit on a throne and we'll sit on thrones. He'll have authority and we'll have authority. We'll judge with him and we'll reign with him and we'll rule with him. And so if you've given your heart to Christ, if you've given the reins of your life, so to speak, and you've, and you've surrendered the wild horses of your heart and you've tied yourself to Jesus by surrendering to him, you are going to be eligible to rule and reign over others in a period that completes the kingdom of God. The reason I'm telling you all this is because it ha this has everything to do with this beatitude. Because I don't know if you've noticed this or not. I, I, I said it last week, I believe, or the first week, that uh, in, in these Beatitudes, there is, there's a connection between the pronouncement and the blessing. I'll show you what I mean. Let's go to the verse. Let's go to these verses. Notice what it says, in seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, all right, here's the pronouncement. Blessed or happy, <laughs> our word markyrios. Um, happy are the poor in spirit. That, that's the pronouncement. So if you're poor in spirit, which means you realize your need for the Lord, is what that poor in spirit means. Doesn't mean so low self-esteem or you go around putting yourself down or you're some little pitiful somebody that doesn't you know, know who you are. It just means... You recognize and understand that you're not the, uh, the end of everything in life, that there's a God in heaven and that you need to surrender to him and that you don't change everything and you don't own everything. and It's all about him and a surrender to him. So um, I, I recognize my need for the Lord. All right, that is the pronouncement. But what is the blessing? Well, the blessing is for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, if you do this, God said, then the, then the kingdom of heaven becomes yours. And then in, in verse 4, it says, blessed are those who mourn, not those who moan, okay, but those who, those who mourn. In, in other words, if your heart is broken and, uh, and, 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 and you can't do anything with this brokenness and, and you are in mourning, what is, the, what is the blessing? The pronouncement is you're blessed if you are brokenhearted. Why? Because he's going to come to you and comfort you. In other words, the pronouncement is you're happy if you're sad because when you're sad, God moves with strength to comfort you. The word comfort means with strength. So when you're truly brokenhearted, what God's going to do is God's going to move in your life with strength so you can be at peace and you can be at ease and you can have comfort in life. Now our one for today is the third beatitude. It says, blessed are the meek. We talked a lot about meekness about five weeks ago. About five weeks ago, we were studying the fruit of the Spirit. You remember this? Galatians 5, verse 21, 22. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, what? Meekness and self-control. For such are the, is the Spirit of God in control of our life. Now, I know I said a lot about meekness five weeks ago, so I, I don't really feel I need to go back through all of that because, of course, obviously... You remember everything I ever said, so it's kind of redundant, I know, I know. And some of you might not have been here, but if you really want to see it, it go to YouTube and type in Freedom River Church, you can watch it. Uh, it, it I, I mean, I, I said an awful lot in describing what meekness was. 
so I don't want to be totally redundant, but just, just for your sake, meekness is, is the only attitude that is also a fruit of the Spirit. Meekness is the only one that's mentioned in both lists as a fruit of the Spirit and as an attitude to be, which is what the Beatitudes are. And meekness, a fruit of the Holy Spirit, means the Holy Spirit works it in our life. It means this is what we can expect from God to do in our life. He's going to work meekness in us. And what was meekness? The word was praeotes. And I know that you might not remember the Greek word, but it's praeotes. And it means strength under control. And so what it is as a fruit of the Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is putting into your life and growing into your life. This is not in the fruit of the Spirit. This is not what you do. This is what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. It's a Holy Spirit work. It doesn't say the fruit of the believer is. It says the fruit of the Spirit is. So God's working self-control into your life by the Holy Spirit. But when we come to an attitude to be, a beatitude, these are attitudes that Jesus had while he was here on earth. This is what Jesus, uh, this is what he wanted to do, what he wanted to be. These are, everybody say, choice. These are things you choose to be. These, you know, you choose the attitude that you have. When things happen in your life, you may not be able to choose what happens in your life, but you can choose how you respond to what happens in life. And that's, and, and that's really the key issue, right? Because most of the things that happen in our life are certainly tremendously out of our control. We can't do anything about lots of things that happen in our life. But the only control we have is, to, is how we're going to respond to the things in life. Those of you that have your outline, you've understood already, I know, because you've been reading what that outline said to you and so forth. But in, in the attitude to be, there's, a, there's a, 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 an implication about what this means. You know, we talked about self-control when it was a fruit of the Spirit, but when we talk about it as an attitude, remember there is a pronouncement and there is a blessing. And the pronouncement really has everything to do with the blessing. And this blessing that he says is if you are under control, then you're going to inherit the earth. In other words, you're going to, your, your prize, if you're, un, if, you're, if you're under control, the prize for that is one day. You're going to inherit the earth. And that has everything to do with what the Spirit is talking about as far as meekness goes in this beatitude. And you'll know if you've got the outline that I've said to you, this beatitude is about uh, how you are with other people. In other words, this, this meekness here is talking about an attitude of, uh, uh, toward other people and that you are under control when it comes to other people. And this is a very difficult thing, but you can choose to allow the Spirit of God to work in your life so that other, your relationship toward other people will make you uh, eligible to rule the, rule the earth one day. In the kingdom of God, in the completion of the kingdom of God, you're going to sit on the throne. You know what the Bible says? The last shall be first and the first shall be last. And uh, the least of these, I'm going to make ruler over many. When's that going to be? It's going to be in this millennial kingdom. And so he's going to set you on a throne and you're going to be set up to rule a certain section. Who is he going to do that to? The person who is under control and has the attitude of bridling that wildness in your life like you would bridle a wild stallion and, uh, and point him in the right direction. You know, a stallion, that, that's the word picture of meekness, by the way, of praeotes. It's a, it's a picture of a tremendously strong, virile, uh, muscular, wild stallion that just can run anywhere and is fast and powerful and strong. The only problem is he's out of control. He runs in all kind of directions. He has no purpose. But when you put a bridle on him and you can bridle him, then as the rider, you can point him in any direction with the bridle and steer him to be purposeful in some area of life. 
You don't break him. You don't break his spirit. You don't break his will. He's just as fast. He's just as powerful. He's just as strong, except now, instead of running helter-skelter everywhere, uh, he's under control of the one who has the reins on his life. And I think the implication is obvious, right? When you give your heart to Christ, your old wild stallion self, you know, your old powerful self, your old self-control, self-centered self that's been running in every direction, helter-skelter and blah, blah in life, all of a sudden Jesus has the reins on you and he controls what direction you go in life. Well, if that's you, this beatitude says, you know what you can expect? You can expect one day to be sitting on a throne with Jesus Christ. You're going to inherit the earth. All of the earth is going to be yours. That's the blessing that we get from the pronouncement. So from that uh, relationship between the pronouncement and the blessing, uh, you get the conclusion that when he's talking about an attitude here of meekness, he's talking about this attitude in connection with how we treat other people. Is our attitude, is our, is our heart under control of the one who has the reins when it comes to relating to other people? Because one day we're going to rule over other people and the only ones that are going to be able to rule over other people are the ones who have been controlled by the Spirit of God so that our attitudes are pure toward them and our attitudes are right because that's the only ones who will be legitimate enough in the kingdom of God, in this perfect kingdom of God, to, for Jesus to sit on a throne and put on a crowd. The last shall be first, first shall be last, the least shall be greatest, and so forth. This is where all these things happen. So this is a connection of a the attitude to how you react to other people in life. And this is a very critical thing in our life because, as we all know, um, having your strength under control when it comes to other people is a very important thing, right? How you treat other people, how you respond to other people is a real test of an attitude in life. Like, like I heard about some hell's angels uh, that went into a, a truck stop and and they had, there was a restaurant there, and the Hell, uh, Hell's Angels went into the restaurant. And when they went into the restaurant, there was a truck driver over in the corner eating his lunch. Well, one of the Hell's Angels walked over to him and got his plate off the table and just took his spaghetti and just dumped it right on the truck driver's head. And then he got the truck driver's drink, and he, he just took it and he poured it in the truck driver's lap. Well, the truck driver just... Like got up, walked up to the uh, cash register, paid the bill, walked out, just calmly walked out the, out of the restaurant and got into his truck and left. And as he was beginning to leave, one of the hell's angels said huh, to the waitress, said, huh, not much of a man, is he? And the waitress said, not much of a truck driver either. Uh, Because he just ran over about 12 choppers going out to drive. (laughs) Yeah, self-control, what we talk about, right? It's really important to have self-control and not overreact to other people. So we can practice a beatitude. We can can practice, I mean, we we can develop a beatitude. The Holy Spirit develops a fruit in you, but you can develop an attitude. So how would you develop an attitude? How could you practice an attitude of not overreacting to other people? How could you practice uh, uh, having the right attitude so that you can grow in the kingdom of God and one day you can reign in the kingdom of God and our lives can reflect Jesus more than ever? Well, I have six ways for you and I'm gonna just hit them real uh, real quick, I know everybody's going, oh, this is six, <laughs> you know. Well, let me just see if I can hit them real quick, all right? All right, Here, here's, how, here's how you can, you can practice your attitude of meekness, of control in your life. Number one, when someone serves you, you are going to be understanding and not demanding. This is from Philippians chapter, chapter 2 where Paul tells the church at Philippi that they need to be understanding 
and not demanding. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 4 or 5. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. In other words, don't be so self-centered in life that you only think about yourself. That when you live around others, you think about their interest and what's going on with them uh, more than you think about what's going on in your life. Let, this, let the mind of Christ be in you, which, let this mind be in you, which is also in Jesus Christ. And what was that? Jesus was a servant. Jesus came to serve. Jesus came to give. Jesus came to die. Jesus offered himself. So this is an encouragement to think about others more than ourselves. So when someone serves you, I'm talking about ways you can practice being meek now. When someone serves you, be understanding with them and not demanding, thereby working the meekness in your life. Because here's the question. How do you treat others who serve you? You know, we're all served by others every day, every week. Somebody serves us. I mean, the obvious ones would be, you know, waiters and waitresses in a rec restaurant. But we have secretaries and we have assistants and we have clerks and we have tellers and we have co-workers and we have family members. My Lord, <laughs> family members, you don't think about them serving you. Well, how do you treat them? How do you treat those people in your life? Are you understanding with them or are you demanding with them? Let me give you a little testimony. There was a time when Pastor Tanya and I uh, worked with professional ministers. I know, I know, you know, it's been a long time, but back when, you know, back when we were just doing total ministry of loan, alone, there were many times that we were with big groups of professional clergy. Well, it sounds kind of like a disease, doesn't it? But, you know, with, with the clergy. <laughs> And, and we would go into a restaurant and, you know, as a big group, uh, it would be one big group and all of it would be professional clergy and, you know, you'd be served by someone like a waiter or a waitress. Well, we would go to large conventions and when we went to large conventions, there might be 40 or 50,000 professional clergy at this one big event. Well, of course, when the breaks came, uh, who filled up all the restaurants? Well, the professional clergy did, every table full. And I can remember many times going into one of these restaurants and sitting at a table. Of course, you know, everybody in there was a professional uh, minister. And so you couldn't help but overhear conversations because everybody was just kind of crammed in there and tables were up. And you would hear these uh, other tables and you would hear them order. And there would be a waiter or a waitress, and bless their heart, usually one of them was a trainee, you know, and, and they were thrown into this really fire zone where everybody was, you know, wanting to order everything. And, and you would hear them, you would hear them uh, taking orders from these people as they go around the table. And, and you would hear uh, the, in their voice and in their actions, you, would just, you could just determine, man, they were impatient, they were, they were imp impolite, they were loud, they were pompous, they were, you know, they were overinflated, they were harsh and rude and, and demanding. And I'd look at Tanya and I'd say, are you hearing this? These are supposed to be representatives of the kingdom of God. And they're being so rude and so arrogant and so harsh and so demanding on these people. And the worst ones would be the ones who somehow could never be satisfied. Have you ever seen these kind of people? No matter what the waiter or waitress did, no matter how the food was prepared or whatever they ordered, these people are never happy about anything, never satisfied about anything. And so it, there was always a put down in a, in a harshness and a demand and then what to make it worse, which is hard to imagine, you know, that kind of situation being worse, made me want to crawl into, under my table and say, I'm not with them, I'm not with them. But, but to make it worse, it, it, they would chew, chew them up one side and down the other and, and just belittle them and, and treat them ugly and harshly and never be satisfied with anything. And then when they would leave the table, instead of leaving a generous tip, which they should have for anybody that would put up with them. They've never left a generous tip. Is there anybody that is, a, that is a, a bigger complainer and worse tippers than professional clergy? I, I don't know, but, you know, I've been with them a lot. You know, they, they think if they leave a dollar, that's a lot, you know, on a table. But instead of leaving a, 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 instead of leaving a generous tip, you know what they'd do? They'd leave a track, a gospel track. 
Yeah, yeah, like how to be saved or uh, the four spiritual laws or, or something like that, you know. And I thought to myself, if I was that waiter and I just served that pompous, arrogant uh, person, and, and I did everything I could to make life good for them, and they treated me so disrespectfully and so arrogantly and so pompously in life. And I walked up to that table, and there wasn't a tip on that table, a big tip, I mean, I mean like, I'm sorry I was a jerk kind of thing. There was a gospel track telling me how to be saved. I, I, my first thought would be, hey, if I got saved, you mean I could be like you? Sure, yeah, that's what I want to be, crunch, and I'm going to throw it in the garbage can. You'd be the furthest thing from anything I'd want to be. And, 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 and let me just tell you, when it comes to someone who serves you, be understanding. Don't be demanding in life. And that practices your self-control and your meekness in life because there are people who serve you all the time. Start with your family. How about that? I mean, your, 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 your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, they serve you. How, how, how do you treat them? How do you act toward them? I mean, is anything they do ever good enough? I mean, a lot of things they don't have to do. Can you, can you be positive about what they did? Can you say thank you for what they did? And and bless them in some way. And when it comes to leaving a tip, you know, I've often wondered, uh, I wonder what the reputation of our church is in the restaurants around here. I know some of you I've been out with before to eat, and, and, and you do real good. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to be with you, and, and you leave generous tips, and you're wonderful and understanding people. But I don't know about you others. You know, I, I kid with you all the time about, you know, letting you go early enough to beat the Presbyterians to the chicken house. But I, you know, I don't know when you get there, when you get there, how you treat people. But uh, it would be interesting to know what kind of reputation. You know, you guys, a, a lot of you are sitting out here today with Freedom River T-shirts on. And I hope that when you go out, uh, if you, you treat people with respect when you have this Freedom River T-shirt on, uh, I would certainly want you to, re to represent the kingdom of God in a very respectful way. But, but, but when it comes to leaving a, a, a tip, uh, forget the track and leave some jack. You know, I mean, forget to... <laughs> I mean, if you're going to put, if you're gonna put a, a track down, at least put some, some jack in it, you know? Mm. That track would be a lot more uh, enjoyable if it had a 20 in it, you know. That, that'd be a, that'd be, I mean, I might actually pick the thing up and read it if it had a 20 in it, you know, and say, bless the God, this person, I know he was ugly, but he, you know, he, he gave me something, and that's his way of saying, please forgive me for being a jerk while, you know, you were trying to help me and serve me. So anyway, when it comes to people who serve, you know, we're talking about how can I practice my meekness? Well, here's one way. When somebody serves you, be understanding and not demanding. Here's a second way. When someone disappoints you, be gentle, not judgmental. Because you are going to be disappointed in life, right? How many of you know this? This is a fact of life. The fact of life and one of the facts of life is that you are going to be disappointed in life and people are going to disappoint you. So when they disappoint you, how do you practice meekness? Well, you practice it by being gentle with them when they disappoint you and not judgmental with them. Look, look, look what uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 1, you know this. Receive one who is weak in faith. Everybody say immature. That's what weak in faith means. It means, it means they have not risen to a level of perfection, okay? I mean, here's a way, here's a way to interpret um, when, you, when it comes to somebody who hasn't reached your level of perfection, okay, um, and they are, they, are, they are immature, more immature than you in their faith, receive them. But not to disputes over doubtful things. And receive them and don't be judgmental about things that 
uh, are up in the air about what the Bible has to say about it or uh, there are some question about what that really means. You know, those of you that are mature in faith know there are lots of things that the Bible talks about that we as Christians handle in different ways. I mean, we to, to some denominations and some people, things are very black and white, cut and dried, yes or no, right or wrong, you know. And then to some others, they're, they're uh, uh, gray areas, you know. I mean, how much the Holy Spirit works in your life? What are the gifts about? How do you operate in the gifts? What is baptism? There, there are some people that teach that baptism is essential to salvation, that you've got to be baptized or you're not even saved. And then others of us say, man, baptism is just, according to Romans 6, is just a, a reflection of fact what Jesus did in our life. Death, burial, and resurrection. Yet you're really just stating a testimony. Well, that is a disputable thing among human beings. So when it comes to that, Romans 14 is saying, look, you need to receive people who haven't reached your level of perfection yet because uh, the Lord, you know, don't be so harsh on them because the, the Lord does not require that they stretch up to where you are in order to, to be saved. So happiness comes from accepting people who don't have to obtain your level of perfection. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Brethren, look here. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any sin, you who are spiritual, <laughs> all right, if you're mature in the faith, if you're, if you're grown in the spirit, then you would be one who is spiritual, right? So he's talking to those of you that have been with the Lord for a long time. You've been taught well and you know the Lord. And you who are spiritual, if somebody is overtaken in a sin, I mean, they've been overtaken by temptation. They've done the wrong thing. They've made wrong choices. They, they've sinned against God. What, how, how is that supposed to be handled? It's supposed to be, to be handled by spiritual people in a way that the person who has sinned can be restored. Restore such a one. And how is your spirit supposed to be? You're supposed to be harsh and judgmental. I mean, you're supposed to beat on them and you shouldn't have done that and you should have done that and why did you do that? No. The question is, how do you react to somebody who messes up their life? Because there are people that mess up their life, and I'll guarantee you that what God says is that those of you who are spiritual, that are mature in the faith, ought to respond to that person with understanding and, and, and a spirit of self-control about them. I guarantee you one of the things that you like about Freedom River Church is that you feel that you can come here and not be judged in life. Amen. I mean, I, I guarantee you the reason you're sitting here in this sanctuary and you're wanting to hear what the Spirit is saying to you today is because your life has been messed up and you found a place where people would be gentle with you and understanding and not be harsh and critical and judgmental and, and, and ugly about everything and that draws you and that gives you an environment in which God can woo you back in and God can minister to you and God can strengthen you and change you. That, that they're not a bunch of rules and you got to do this and do that or else you got to go and all that. Uh, that that's, uh, that's an attitude. That's, a, that's, a, that's a, an attitude of meekness where God can be in control of your life and some of what God wants to do in your life can, he can do. I mean, how do you handle how do you handle it when people mess up their life? Do you do you look at them and say, "I told you so. I saw it coming. I don't know why you did that. Only a fool would do that. I, I would never be that dumb." I mean, do you have kind of a secret sense of satisfaction when somebody blows it in life? Well, meekness is when people disappoint you. You are gentle and not judgmental. Jesus was perfectly uh, an example of this. John 8 as an example. In John 8, they bring Jesus uh, to Jesus out in public, a woman who has committed adultery. You remember this story, right? And they caught her in the very act. And they brought her to Jesus out in public. And, 
And, and what did Jesus do? Jesus bent down and he started writing, you know. And I, I, you say, what was he writing? Well, I don't know for sure, but he might have been writing the sins of the people standing around. And when they saw their sin listed down there, they said, Woo, uh, um, I got something cooking on the stove. I better get on up out of here, you know. And before long, there was nobody standing around, <laughs> only Jesus and the woman. And Jesus looked at her and said, uh, does no man condemn you? And she said, no, Lord. And he said, well, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, what, what, the, what the crowd wanted, what the Pharisees wanted, was for him to react harshly to her and condemn her publicly and put her in her place. And, you know, adultery was an act that you could be stoned to death for. That's what he wanted. That's what they wanted to happen. But, but publicly, he was gentle with her. Publicly, he dealt with her in a gentle way. And then privately, he, he, he said, I'm not, I'm not saying that your sin's okay. I'm saying, go and don't do that anymore. Go and sin no more, which means I'm not accepting what you did. I'm telling you what you did is not good. All right, now that you've been, stop doing it. That's exactly, that's exactly right. So there you go. When, uh, when somebody messes up, you know, just be understanding. Here's a third way. When somebody disagrees with you, be tender without surrender. You know, I've given you a fact already that people are going to disagree with you. Let me give you another fact of life. I know you know this, but you can't please everybody in life, right? Hmm? I mean... Uh, I've said to Pastor Tanya before, you know, if everybody in life was as perfect as we are, uh, this world would be a better place. <laughs> of course, I know I'm being funny about that, but, uh, but the, because, because the fact is, I don't care who you are, Jesus couldn't please everybody all the time, and you're not going to do it either. You know, when you get group A happy, group B flares up, right? Then when you settle down group B, then group A flares back up. I mean, there's always something going on like that. One minute you're the hero, the next minute you're the zero. Um, so here comes an opportunity to be tender without surrender. Because the real test of meekness in your life is, how do you handle disagreeable people? I mean, you know, those people that irritate you. Those people that argue with you. Those people that, 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 that contradict you in life. You know, those difficult people. I mean, anybody can handle people that are gracious and kind and gentle and polite, right? I'm talking about how do you handle people that are disagreeable, that are grouchy in their nature, that really give you problems. Well, you have three alternatives in how you handle people. And let me give, you, give them to you real quick. You can retreat in fear. You can react in anger, or you can respond in love. All right, let's look at the first one. The first one is you can retreat with fear. But, but Paul said to Timothy, look at what he said to Timothy. He said, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So uh, according to Paul, as a Christian, that we're... We're not timid. We're not fearful about things. We don't, we don't run away from things. God has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. A sound mind means a stable mind. It means a, a mind that's in control. So the Spirit of God fills us with love, power, and a mind that is under self-control. So that's not, that's not a mind. That's not an attitude that would run away from difficult people in our life and fear. So meekness is not compromising your convictions. Meekness doesn't mean that you're passive. Meekness is not being a doormat and always giving in and always letting others have their way. That would actually be bad at times, right? Because many times their way is going to get them in deep trouble and it's going to lead them into a dangerous place and a hard thing. And if, you let every, if you're just a doormat in life, it just means that you probably are filled with a spirit that fears man and fears being criticized by others rather than the Spirit of God. So one of the options you have when disagreeable people in your life is you can retreat in fear. Here's the second one. You can react in anger. React in anger means all you know that that you just uh, blow up and and blow them away, 
I mean, you, you say a few choice words here and you point out a few choice things there, verbal overkill, man. You just, uh, you just, you just, you just intimidate them. You, you roar like a lion and you just overwhelm them and you blast them. But look at what the scripture says about that in James. So then, my beloved brethren, let everyone be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath which is a great uh, uh, prescription for curbing anger in your life. If you are swift to hear and slow to speak, you're going to be slow to wrath. If you are quick to speak and slow to hear, you're going to blow up real easy. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In other words, no matter how angry you get about something, you're never going to make that thing right with God. And so to respond in anger, if somebody disagrees with you and you just blow them away and everything in life becomes a win-lose proposition, where when something happens, you got to win everything. I love, there's a one-liner from General Patton. General Patton said, don't get in battles where winning doesn't matter. Pretty good advice, right? Don't get in a battle where winning doesn't matter. Now, I know a lot of people might take that, that little one-liner and say, well, Patton was saying that everything ought to be about winning and losing. No, what Patton was saying is there are going to be lots of opportunities to have battles in your life that don't matter. So don't argue about stuff and don't get angry about stuff that doesn't matter. We, I, I, sadly, there are many things in my life that I have gotten angry about that don't matter in life. And a, a few years ago, I, I, I can't remember how long, but, but some years ago, the Holy Spirit challenged me about that. Like when I was all kind of getting all bent out of shape on something, like Tanya said it happened at five o'clock on July the 4th, and I said it happened at six o'clock on July the 4th. The Holy Spirit said in me, seriously, I mean, it's kind of like I heard him, you know, inside my own mind, but, but I heard him say, what difference does it make? And, you know, I thought to myself, what difference does it make? It doesn't make a bit of difference whether it was at five o'clock or six o'clock. I mean, who, who cares is really what the point is. And so in this beatitude, uh, it, it's t you know you have a choice on how you respond. So do you retreat in fear? You're afraid, and you let somebody overpower you and dominate you, and you're just a doormat, and it, whatever they say, you you go with. Or do you respond in anger and you just blow up and you just verbal overkill and you intimidate them and rant and rave and you know and, and just overpower them with your with your with the power of your voice and your anger and your and your and your and your presence? You know, you're very intimidating, men. We're the biggest thing in the house. We're the most powerful thing in the house. We can hurt everybody there. And, and a lot of times, you know, we use our position to intimidate instead of. Instead of responding in love, you can do that. You can retreat in anger. You can, re you can, you can have a retreat in fear. You can respond in anger. Or here's the third one. I can res uh, you can respond in love. I can be tender without surrender. Everybody say that. I can be tender. I can be tender. Now, you guys may have a trouble even saying the word. I can be tender. I can be tender without surrendering Everything in my life. Look, at, uh, this is Proverbs 15. Great uh, Proverbs is full of great one and two liners. And this is one of them. A soft answer turns away wrath. Wrath is the outward explosion of anger, but, ha but a harsh word stirs up anger. And we know that. Whenever you say something and I say something gentle back to you, it kind of takes the stinger out of it, doesn't it? I, I, I teach in uh, Journey, you know, sprinkle a little salt on it. Before you say it, sprinkle a little salt. Everything tastes better with a little bit of salt on it, you know? You don't have to be so harsh and, and angry in how you say things. And when you say things back, if you say it gently, it, it, it promotes some easing of the issue. If you pop back with something sarcastic, smart aleck, and, you know, all of that, it's just going to make things worse. It's just going to stir it up. But, a, but harsh words stir up anger. Yeah, it, it, it sure does. Because James 3 says, for where there's envy and self-seeking, confusion and every evil thing are there. In other words, if you're, if 
you're if you're in a an, uh, if you're in an issue and the issue is is full of envy and self-centeredness and self-promotion and all about self it won't be surprising what will be there what kind of evil thing will be there any kind of thing harshness wrath murder uh you know <laughs> injustice i mean any evil thing could be there because that's the attitude and that's the environment that's been that's been uh, created by that but the wisdom that is above, above is first pure. In other words, if the attitude of the, of the condition is godly and we have God invited into it, what's God going to bring with him? Pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of the righteous is sown in peace by those who make peace. So you have an opportunity whenever you are... In a, in a quarrel with somebody, in a disagreement with somebody, in an argument with somebody, because we all end up finding ourselves there sooner or later, you can respond in a way that will be in love. If you respond in love, then you're led by the meekness of God. And I know that has to be something practiced, right? I know everybody has to learn how to do that because it just really doesn't come natural to us to want to be that. But let me, let me move on because I know we got a bunch of them and we're run, we've already run out of time. Let me give you this. All right, when someone corrects you, be teachable and not reachable, unreachable. Be teachable and not unreachable. Meekness is a teachable attitude. Meekness, meek people are eager to learn. Why? Because meek people are aware that they don't know everything. A meek person doesn't have to pretend that they know everything. In, 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 uh, in, in uh, James chapter 1, verse 19, we, we reread the verse a few moments ago, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Uh, that's the key to temper control. You know, you're quick to listen and slow to speak. You're not going to get angry very quickly like I mentioned to you. God gave us two ears and one tongue. What's the implication that we're supposed to listen twice as much as we talk? Uh, to be teachable and not unreachable. The question, a question would be like this. When your spouse makes some suggestive uh, corrections in your life, uh, how do you handle that? Do you quickly make about two or three suggestions of your own? Or, or, or do you say, well, i got to consider the source. <laughs> well, let me give you a suggestion. Don't consider the source. Consider the suggestion. Let me give, let me give you a little, kind of like a little thought about how to receive criticism. Because I know you guys get criticized, and you feel like you're criticized. And I know I have too, and this is what I've learned. All right, if it's false, if the criticism is false... Reject it. If it's silly, laugh at it. If you can't laugh at it, it's probably true. So I don't want to consider the suggestion. I don't want to consider the source. I want to consider the suggestion. Because as a meek person, I realize I don't have all the answers in life. And we're all ignorant and we're all brilliant, only in different subjects. Let me tell you one of the dumbest things ever happened to me in life. I felt, that I felt so dumb. I mean, this is ridiculous. But let me tell you, after it happened, I've never done this before, again, so I learned a good lesson. But just to show you how <laughs> we're all brilliant, we're all ignorant in different, and just on different things, I'll guarantee you, you get in your field and you are brilliant. You get in somebody else's field and you may not even know one thing about it. And, and, and so we're all teachable because we're all, we can all teach each other something is what I'm saying. So meekness allows you to be taught something by someone else. Let me tell you, let me give, this happened uh, 25 years ago or so. We lived in a pastorium right beside a church bill, a church in Meridian. And I pastored this church for 14 years, and we lived in a house provided by the church, right by the church. And I had gotten a, a new vehicle. Um, when I went there, it was a, a little Toyota pickup, and it was an automatic on the floor. Well, I was used to driving a standard shift. 
And so when I drive, when I park it, you know, and I'm driving a standard shift, I just leave it in gear and, you know, just that's what holds it there. You just leave it in gear. And of course, then when you come back and crank up, you just push it in and you crank it up. Well, I'm driving an automatic transmission that has a shift on the floor. And so when I park my truck, it's on a flat place. I, it stays in drive, the gear I was in, and I just turn it off, go in. It didn't roll because it was on a very flat surface. Well, when I come back out and I get in it, and you guys know what happened, right? I hit the key, nothing. Oh, I mean, it wouldn't even make a sound. I turn the lights on, battery's fine, everything's good, but it won't even make a sound. So I, uh, I hit it again, and nothing, nothing, and I had a friend and a church member who was a mechanic, and so I call him. He's a mechanic now at a business. And he said, well, Brother Keith, he said, uh, when I, at lunch, you know, I'll come out there and check it for you and see what's wrong with it. So he comes out there at lunch. Now the man leaves, drives five, six miles from where he works, comes out there, gets in my truck, going to help me because I'm thinking something, man, something is wrong. What is it? The alternator, the battery, what, what, what's wrong? The starter, something's wrong with this thing, you know? And he gets in there and he tries it and sure enough, nothing happened. I said, man, that's exactly what happened with me. And he reached down, he took it and he put it in neutral. He just put, dropped it up one time and wow, I cranked up. Everything was wonderful. That's when I learned something in life. Automatics won't crank in anything but park or neutral. One or the other. So let me just say to you that if you ever get in one and you turn it and nothing happens, the first thing you need to do is make sure it's either in neutral or in park, and it'll crank and do it serve you well. See, I'm just saying we all can learn something in life from others in life. And a meek spirit allows you to receive from others. Now, I've got, how many more do I have? Three, two more? Okay, here it is. When somebody hurts you, be an actor, not a reactor. Now, by an actor, I'm talking about an initiator. I'm not talking about be a faker. I'm talking about when somebody, when somebody hurts you, and that's another fact of life, right? I've already given you two of them. The fact is you, people are going to disagree with you, and the fact is that you can't please everybody. Let me give you another fact of life. You're, in life, you're going to get hurt. <clears throat> Every one of us are going to get hurt by somebody else. Sometimes accidentally and sometimes intentionally. People are going to hurt us in life. <laughs> so when it comes to the fact that somebody has hurt you, be, be an initiator in the way you respond and not somebody who just reacts. A rea to how do, how do people, what is the normal reaction? When somebody hurts you, what is, what is the worldly normal thing that happens when some other person offends you? Hurt yeah, hurt them back. Uh, the word revenge comes to my mind, right? Uh, or the word retaliate comes to my mind. Well, revenge is to react. To uh, uh, Retaliate is to react. So when, as a matter of fact, the world even has a slogan. It's so common in, wor in the world to get revenge and get retaliation that the world even has a slogan. What is it? Revenge is sweet, right? That's what the world says about getting revenge. And especially if you can get them back and they don't know what happened. They'll never know what hit them. I mean, I mean uh, we, are, we seemingly are at our creative best when we're tr thinking up some way to get back at somebody and, and pay them back and they don't even know it. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we savor that kind of stuff. Well, I'm just saying to you that to do that is to react and not to act. I mean, uh, let, let's say it like, uh, what this is about is you have to choose how you're going to respond when people hurt you before they even hurt you. That's what initiating means. It means I already have a plan for when I get hurt by somebody, how I'm going to react because I'm going to initiate rather than to react. Now, to react, you know what react does? React gives somebody else the power to determine how happy you are in life. Jesus said, if you will initiate, you choose whether you're happy or not. Happy are those 
who, who are meek because the kingdom of God is theirs. They will inherit the earth. So you can choose to be happy. But to, to be happy, you're the one who has to be in control and not someone else. And if you retaliate to somebody else, you just let them be in control of whether you're happy in life or not. But if you choose to do what, 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 what you feel like the Lord would have you do, I'm going to tell you something. I have forgiven people that haven't even asked me for forgiveness. Yeah, I mean, if I didn't, let me tell you what's going to happen. They're going to control my life. I'm going to lay in bed at night figuring out ways to get them back and hurt them and, and, and punish them like they hurt me. They're going to be in control of the adrenaline in my life and the thoughts in my life. And they're going to be laying at bed at home asleep, snoring through life. And I'm going to be up walking the floor pacing. How can I hear them? I'm going to tell you the next time I see them, this is what I'm going to say to them. I mean, you just strategizing about how you're going to get revenge or what you're going to say the next time. No, no, no. And you're unhappy and they're, they're oblivious to anything about it. And you're letting them control the happiness in your life. So I choose. I make a choice. And that's to initiate rather than to react. Let me give you this one. This, uh, there's, that's just let it overcome evil. When you share your faith, this is the last one. When you share your faith, respect them, don't reject them. All right, now, I'm going to get right to the point. The point is in life, when we share our faith with someone else, we're sharing our faith in order to influence them to give their lives to Christ, right? That, 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 they are, they're, that they would be blessed if they allow Jesus Christ to live in their heart, that he would change their life. Now, we need to be careful when we do this, and we need to practice meekness when we do this. Control, self-control. Because it's really easy to come off as, as feeling, as somebody interpreting what you're saying as you feeling a sense of superiority over them. Because it's, it's very easy when you're sharing your faith, and, and you're sharing your faith, you're basically saying, you need to do what I did because I gave myself to the Lord and he changed my life. Well, it's easy to ha for that to come across as being uh, you, you need the Lord because you need to be like me because your life is so bad and my life is so good, you need to be like me. So it, what, what I'm saying is you have to guard against that kind of spirit and you do that by, uh, uh, by being sensitive and caring about how you go about speaking to someone in life. And to, to accept someone is not the same as approving of someone. Because I know a lot of times everybody says, well, you can't accept these. Man, these people are sinners. They, you know, commit adultery and they live a double lifestyle and they're blah, blah, whatever it is that really uh, makes your bell ring as far as being sinful. And it's hard for you to witness to people if you don't have an attitude of meekness because you just, I mean, some people are so wicked that, that you're just saying, well, man, I'm, and I, can't, I can't accept their lifestyle. And, and it comes out when you're talking to them. They sense that and they feel that. They know that. And it's like, you're not, they're not even going to listen to what you say if you, if you have that kind of attitude. So we need to understand that Acceptance doesn't mean the same thing as approval. Acceptance is basically, I accept you as a human being. I expect you as someone God, accept you as someone who God created in his image, and you're worthy because God loves you and God has created you. That is acceptance. I accept the fact that you needed to be treated respectfully, like I need to be treated respectfully, like everybody else needs to be treated respectfully. But to approve somebody means I approve your lifestyle and blah, blah, blah. So you can accept somebody without approving every single thing they do in life is what I'm trying to say to you. There are two ways that you can get an egg out of an eggshell. You can, you, can, you, know, you can take a hammer and 
and crack it open and, and, and do that. And some people's attitudes like that, They're, they have the attitude of a hammer. Every, you know, if you have an attitude of a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And you can crush that thing or you can put it in a nice, warm, uh, caring incubator and let that thing incubate and, 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 a, and a chick will come out. One, one takes the life of a chick, one uh, uh, gives the life of a chick, but it's a choice that you make. How do you, how do you receive someone? Do you try to hammer them into the kingdom of God or do you care for them and love them and nurture them and allow them to be born into the kingdom of God? That's the attitude I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you witness to somebody, understand that if they don't accept you, they're not going to listen to what you say. And you're not going to have any influence over them if, you, if you're not gentle about the way you share the gospel. The gospel is not a thinly veiled put down. The gospel is life. And the Lord wants us to share. Look, Jesus was gentle. Jesus was meek. And he wants us to share him with others in meekness and in gentleness in life so that they can receive and be saved. So anyway, there you go. There's six ways to practice meekness in life. And that'll help you have the attitude that Jesus had. All right? All right. Just